good to see all of you. Thank you for staying with us on this group. All right, we're gonna go ahead and get started. Um, this morning, this meeting is only scheduled for a half an hour, so I'm gonna move quickly through the information that I have to share. Some of it will be repetitive, so if you were on the um, board meeting, uh, if you watch the board meeting this week, a lot of the information will be similar. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen. So as you have probably heard, because you can't turn on the news without hearing about it, um, the COVID numbers in Illinois and around the country are spiking again. Region nine, uh, which is the Illinois region of Lake and McHenry counties uh, has been spike spiking as well. Um, Lake County numbers don't look good at all. This is Lake County here. Um, we will be in tier two mitigation, which lowers uh, gathering sizes to 10 later this week on Saturday. Um, as you may or may not have heard, the Illinois Department of Health issued an order yesterday or an ask, a recommendation for folks to stay home for the next three weeks um, so that we can try to get numbers down and try to keep schools and businesses open. Um, our zip code numbers uh, are also not looking great. Um, we have, as you can see, we've been kind of hovering as since we've been in school. So we've been in school here and we've kind of hovered around that 20 cases has been the top, you know, and then it's kind of come down uh, and then gone up and come down and gone up. But the last, uh, the last week or so, we've seen the same spike in our zip code that the county is seeing as well, um, which is well over the threshold of 14 per 100,000 cases. So again, just to, to help people understand, the incidence rate for zip codes is by 10,000 people because most zip codes don't have 100,000 people, um, but the threshold is still 14. So although it says 4.43 per 10,000, then we multiply both those numbers by 10 to figure out what the actual number is, the incidence rate compared to that threshold of 14 per 100,000. Um, so at this point, um, I'm gonna open it up for thoughts or discussion, um, but I'm gonna be very honest. We've seen a spike in absences with our staff. Uh, we have seen uh, a spike in the student absences, students you know, needing to quarantine or stay home because they are, you know, have a, a contact in their home. Um, and I know that uh, holidays are coming up so that's concerning as well, considering we probably have folks that are going to travel. So my thoughts right now, um, and I'm again, opening it up for thoughts or discussion, um, is that we take a pause beginning Monday through Thanksgiving. And I would like to send a survey out to our families on whether or not they plan to travel. Um, I, and I'm going to be very, um, <laughs> very frank here. I think it's great if people travel to see their families. I know how much people are struggling right now. This has not been an easy year. The last eight months have been extremely difficult uh, for our staff and for our families and community. And there's absolutely no judgment on my part or anyone here if people choose to travel and go see people that they love. I just need to be very uh, real about the risks that we will encounter when we come back to school. Um, and make sure that we have a timeline in place that keeps everyone safe. Because when we return, we will be incorporating the additional students that want to be in person. And you know the additional staff that we need in the buildings to accommodate that. Um, some of those are existing staff. Some of those are new staff members. We have um, three paraprofessionals that we're hiring to support that work, to have those students come in. And I just wanna get a pulse on, you know, what is the best timeline so that we can keep everyone safe uh, when we decide that uh, we'd like to come back because we won't be coming back with the numbers that we have, we'll be coming back with bigger numbers. So with that, I will open it up for thoughts or discussion. Don't be shy.
Lisa, will the survey go out to staff members as well in regards to traveling for the holiday? You know, I hadn't uh, thought of that, but I think that's a good idea to get an idea of what our staff plans to do as well. Yeah, thank you, Sarah. Uh, Dr. Leali, thank you for all of your uh, careful consideration. Um, if we take this pause and we come back from Thanksgiving and the numbers are still high, would we continue maybe uh, being fully remote or would we come back and then just sort of see how the numbers roll? Yeah, so the decision to come back is going to have to do with one, um, the percentage of people who are traveling. Um, it would have to do with significantly reduced incidence rates in our zip code and also the health and well-being of our staff. Um, those three pieces are the pieces that we need to have in place. Um, and, the, and again, the percentage of parents traveling really just has to do with how, how long we need to give people so they can, um, you know, have some time alone in their homes before they come back and interact with the rest of the staff. Does that make sense, Ann? Thanks. I'll speak up. I do think um, based on the numbers we're seeing and information that's coming out that the pause does make a lot of sense at this time. I've even heard of districts that are um, similar to ours as far as the plan that they've had in place, uh, having a lot of students in, or as many as possible in, have started to make decisions about um, pausing from Thanksgiving through Martin Luther King at this time. Yeah, um, so I'm, wondering, also, yep. I'm wondering if that's something that we would also consider or if it's something that the community or teachers would um, appreciate as far as making the call sooner for planning purposes, because I know it's hard for people kind of the week to week becomes challenging as far as planning for teachers from the perspective of what, you know, what is school going to look like, especially if we're possibly bringing the um, kids that have been at home back in the anticipation of that getting classrooms set up getting structures in place, um, that aspect, but also parents who are at home. Um, trying to navigate what the child care scenario looks like or what uh, what the day-to-day -day looks like. So just something I'm throwing out there, I've seen that that's something that's been happening in the community. Oh, I appreciate it, Jackie. Um, it, the point's well taken too, because that is a, a thing that we're trying to navigate, which is, you know, how do we, how do we support, you know, everyone's plans? And for a while there, the data was sort of pretty volatile, you know, in our community in terms of up and down and up and down. And so it really made sense to look kind of week to week and monitor it that way. Um, the, the districts that are that are doing that um, break, I think have also, some of them have also done that kind of survey to see because uh, around January 20th would be about two weeks out from winter break. So if folks are traveling, then they have that two week break to kind of stay in their homes and and uh, quarantine. So that's kind of the thinking um, is potentially we might be able to make a call like that if we know that a lot of folks are are going to be planning to do that. Um, and you know, I would I mean, I know I, I hope this goes without saying I would we need a hundred percent participation on the survey. We need everyone to be honest. There's no judgment about it. Um, you know, and we'll have to make an assumption that if we don't get a survey from a family that they probably are traveling, you know, so that we can make sure we keep everyone safe. So, um, yeah, it's a great point because, that, you know, I know it's challenging to find, find that child care piece, you know, for some families if they're going to be out. So, I'm sorry, I was a little confused on the survey for traveling. Is this it sounds like if there's a certain percentage of people traveling, then you're more inclined to keep school remote closed until after Christmas? Potentially, yeah. So I'll ask uh, two different questions. One about travel over Thanksgiving, and then because that will help inform our December plans. And then anybody traveling over winter break would be a separate question. So that could inform us after winter break in those plans. I'll, you know, I also had a call from our liaison to the Naval Base 
because um, we have some families um, that are attached to that organization and their sort of suggestion was also to consider kind of a longer break after um, the winter break to accommodate the travel and things like that. They're hearing a lot of districts do that as well. Uh, um, the question is, has there been any discussion about delaying the return of the remote at home students? As a current remote at home family, I'm concerned about changing classrooms around and uh, disturbing the environment for all students when we are looking at increasing COVID numbers and like more, uh, likely more remote time for everyone. So nothing will change until we come back and, and we have those, in, those more in-person families in person, if that makes sense. So whenever we can come back, that's when the things would change. So until we're able to accommodate those folks, we'll keep everything the way it is. Uh, just be remote, if that makes sense. Because you're right, we don't want to kind of upset the apple cart when we don't need to. Um, we would go ahead and communicate what those changes would look like in the next couple weeks. Um, and then the changes would take place when we're able to come back to school. I hope that makes sense. At least if I could, the only thing I might add to that, um, as I, I think I mentioned last week, middle school is looking very closely at kind of those wishing to return in a hybrid fashion versus a five day a week fashion. And I would tell you that the survey, while almost complete, uh, has shown that we have actually more families interested in moving from a five day a week to a, to a hybrid option. So uh, I don't want for families to think that if they've selected that option that they would have to wait. We, we could honor a move from five days a week to hybrid uh, whenever they're ready to make that move. Uh, but right, uh, the bringing in of a larger group of kids uh, would still yeah, be hinging, hinging upon a return to, for all kids. Yeah, I appreciate you bringing that up, Nate, because we did, we have seen, you know, even since we sent out the survey for people uh, who want to potentially come in, as we've been contacting families or they, some have contacted us that they're sort of backing off on that decision right now anyway, due to the numbers um, and the metrics in Lake County. If I could share a unique perspective, some of you saw my daughter make an appearance uh, and I'm, I'm working from home today. So while uh, she and my son are in, in daycare, um, and daycare centers can operate, at least from my conversations with their director, uh, in, into a phase three guidance, they can continue. But they did have a positive case at, at their daycare center. And so they were the center was closed for, for two weeks and Abby's room happened to have the case in it. And so her room more than two weeks, which I think is larger than the guidance we have. They follow uh, not just the Lake County Health Department, but really DCFS is their first point of contact. And so I just know, that there's other families that have also had daycare centers being affected. Um, I wanna be in school with our students as much as anyone, uh, but it, my wife and I don't have immediate family nearby and uh, with what's going on, it just made things challenging. So it's just a perspective that I've lived and you know, I know others may face too, even though centers can remain open in some capacity despite raising numbers. If a case does come into the center, it seems like DCFS is saying there's a little more uh, protocol under their guidance there than what is a little different from what we see. Yeah, I appreciate that, Joe. And, and I, I'm sure that is contributing potentially to our absences as well, our staff absences that we're experiencing. And the, the, you know, the trouble with that is we already know that we've had a sub shortage. We've had it since before COVID. And um, we have you know, had to consistently and increasingly in the last couple of weeks shuffle people around, which number one is disruptive to students and staff, it's also disruptive to programming. You know, I mean, we we have people who have had to shift job responsibilities uh, day to day because we need them to cover a classroom um, and to supervise students. And that's just, you know, it, it's not necessarily helpful um, and certainly doesn't honor the work that all of our teachers are trying to do in their respective um, positions. So as I told the board on uh, Tuesday, you know, this is all about risk mitigation, and I know that, and there's a lot of risk here right now in this situation. There's a ton of risk. There's risk to academic growth and achievement uh, for students who struggle at home. There's risk to social emotional wellness for students who are um, isolated or feeling disconnected. 
there's a risk of health and safety for people who come in the building that has never been a zero and it can't be right now. It's just not. And I cannot guarantee a zero risk health and safety environment for our uh, for our staff and students. It's about mitigation that way. And the other risk that is, is the one that's creeping in is instructional leadership and, and a loss of support in that way because our principals and assistant principals are managing right now. They're managing COVID, they're managing illness, they are managing substitutions, they're managing communication. And I, I find myself in that situation as well. The majority of my time is taken up looking at numbers and data and communicating with folks and trying to help people understand why we're making the decisions that we're making. And I know I'm not the only superintendent and ours are not the only principals that are struggling with this issue. But our obligation is to provide a, a solid education to our kids and neither option feels good. Uh, you know, right now, neither option feels like it comes without risk and, and, and it will be the best option for us. But at some point, the balance starts to tilt, right? Um, we were doing really well there for a while and things were moving along uh, with, you know, offering the choice to our community. And, 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 you know, all along, we have not wanted families to have to choose between their child's health and safety and their educational uh, experience. And, you know, we wanted to be able to do that by offering the best type of programming that we could, no matter what parents chose. And I, you know, I felt really confident for a long time there. And the last month or so has been a real challenge to keep moving um, because the, the balance has shifted towards management and symptoms and communication and follow up at the health department and talking with staff who are, you know, nervous and concerned and talking with parents who are nervous and concerned and uh, you know, it's, we don't want to get too far away from our obligation of, of a solid education for our kids. And I know that this is a really tough, uh, tough decision and it's challenging for some parents to, to handle remote learning at home. I've expressed many times, I have three kids at home who have been remote since March and um, it's getting tough. It's getting really, really tough in my house. Um, you know, my girls are feeling very disconnected from their friends, um, disconnected from school. It's not a fault of the teachers. It's just the situation. You know, my son is missing out on high school experiences that we all know are super important. Um, and his passion, which is playing, you know, the trombone. And that's not something that is safe to do in groups right now. So um, as a mom, I get it. I, you know, I get how difficult this decision is. As an educator, I also get it. Um, we, we want our teachers to be able to do the best they can for our kids. Uh, will the survey in include if families are having out-of-state visitors for the holidays? For example, their homes might be housing several members outside of the immediate family. That's a good point. Thank you, Brandy. Um, and, and maybe it's not travel, maybe it's just, um, uh, do you plan on, you know, gathering with folks outside of your home for the holidays? Maybe that's just it. Maybe it's not even travel because we all know, like, you could stay in Lake County and the numbers are pretty bad. <laughs> the spread can happen there anyway. So it's a good point. Thank you, Brandy. Yeah, I was going to piggyback on that. Just that travel. I feel like the the larger issue, as far as I've seen, is like these larger gatherings, and we're seeing those are really the super spreader events when you have like a large gathering with people outside of your immediate family. So I feel like sometimes it's not even the traveling that's the issue. It's what you do when you get there. And that can look very different. I could stay in my lovely town of Wakanda and, and see a bunch of people. And that's just as bad as me going to Florida. And, you know, and I just feel like that's something that we all need to realize. And I feel like it's, it's really hard because it's a sacrifice because some of us are used to, I have a very large family and I'm used to these big blowout things around the holidays. And I had the personal experience of having to ma make a decision. And it wasn't even a decision I had to think twice about, about canceling a wedding. And I feel like you just have to do certain things to keep people safe. And like it wasn't even a question for us whether or not we were going to bring people, even 50 people together, because it, it's not to me a, a risk that's worth it. And I know it's hard. And I think it's so hard to not see your, like I have a grandpa and who knows how long I have left with him, but 
It's just that we really have to be careful about who we're impacting. I feel like outside of our own families and our own bubbles. And I feel like that is why the holidays are causing a little bit of anxiety for not only everybody, but for teachers, especially thinking about, well, I know what I'm doing for my holidays, but I don't know what all the kids are doing for their holidays or my fellow staff members. And it's just creating a little bit of compounding anxiety, I think. So just knowing that that's out there and that it, it's going to be really challenging for people. And I know if I'm feeling it, like I'm feeling sad over it. And I think a lot of people, it's okay to feel upset over it, but that we need to know that we have to, especially if we're going to be in person for a period of time, just making sure that we're safe and respecting that. I appreciate um, that, Amanda. Thanks. If I, if I could add one thing, and I know I said this during our last meeting, but I think it bears repeating because I continue to get uh, questions from families about uh, why uh, a student who's in person can't receive instruction from their teacher live and in person. Um, again, the, the system that we built, and, and Dr. Liali already mentioned the struggles we face with substitutes. We just don't have any, frankly. And, and really the only reason that we've been able to maintain the in-person option right now is simply because we have the capability of doing internal coverage to a certain extent because of that fully remote platform, because of that asynchronous, synchronous revolving schedule. So I wanted to just remind those that are watching that, that while it might not be your preference, it has allowed us to remain open in a scenario where we wouldn't have otherwise been able to do so. So I wanted to be very clear about that. Um, I'll also echo, you know, the other folks that are uh, both uh, educators and parents, right? I've got three kids, same thing. Today would have been my freshman's first day of a hybrid opportunity that got postponed. I have, a, I have got three kids at home that I want in school, just as I want our students in school. We all feel that same way. Um, and, and I have received quite a bit of communication over the course of the last week from uh, families just expressing how strongly they feel about having their kids uh, be in, in school. I, I just, I've got to say it, that we agree, we understand, we want kids here. We know it's better for them to be here, but there are also a lot of uh, factors to be considered. And, and, and I'm going to go ahead and be real open about this. We have these uh, procedures and processes and, and, and um, you know, mitigating efforts going on in school and kids are doing a great job. They're wearing their masks. They're for the most part staying six feet apart and respecting and responding to us when we tell them they've got to move apart. And then I walk out of school at the end of the day and there's 50 kids playing football across the street no masks climbing all over one another. And I struggle with that. And I understand the desire for kids to have a normal experience. And I understand that families want for their students to be able to uh, enjoy, uh, you know, enjoy being a kid. I, I get that. I totally do. Um, the problem is that COVID doesn't stop at our doorstep when you're wearing a mask and a six foot. We've got kids who are still getting sick. And, and when they do, uh, it impacts us. So uh, I'm not, again, not judging those, those folks that I'm watching as they move around Lake Bluff, but I would really strongly encourage our families to think about kind of what parameters they're providing for their own kids and recognize that it may come down to the point that you can't have it both ways. You can't necessarily allow, uh, you know, a group of 30 kids to play and have a sleepover or, or, or do the things that a lot of kids are doing and not necessarily have that trickle over into the school environment. So um, so candidly, I struggle with that. I walk out to climb in my car at the end of the day and I, and I just kind of do this. Um, so. I appreciate you saying that, Nate. I think we've all as an administrative team struggled with that as well. I just kind of want to piggyback off the elementary, same thing when our kids dismiss and then I go down to the crossing guard area and see groups of students and parents, um, some with masks, some without. It's hard, like, you know, do you say, please put your mask on or do you just let them go? Um, it's just, you know, something we would, it, it's a struggle. And I do want to recognize, we all understand that, uh, there are different approaches to handling the information that is out there about this virus and what, what could mitigate it, how dangerous it is, who it's dangerous for. Um, anybody who works with data knows that you can look at data in lots of different ways when you're looking for something, when you're looking for the outcome that you would like to have happen. And I can tell you that um, that's been really difficult as well for superintendents across the state and the country 
Um, there's so much conflicting information. There's so much passion around this issue. Um, and, you know, I feel really confident that we have done the absolute best job that we could possibly do to accommodate um, the needs of our community thus far. And I'm really proud of that. I really am. And I'm proud of our team and I celebrate everything that we've done because it's been a tremendously difficult fall semester. Um, and, and, and uh, on the heels of an extraordinarily challenging spring semester. Um, and I want our folks to be able to concentrate for a while on looking at the academics, looking at the growth, supporting our kids educationally, all of them, um, and, and have our teachers be able to do that work without the anxiety that they're experiencing right now as we all see the numbers rise. And nobody knows uh, exactly what their risk is until they get the disease. And quite frankly, I don't want to be the one that puts people in the position to have them realize what the consequences are. Um, and that's a, a heavy weight and a heavy responsibility. And certainly we all take it on. This is what we are, we're in it for. Um, and uh, so again, I think, I think moving into a pause right now considering all these factors is a smart decision for us, for, for our students in our community, which includes our staff and um, being really honest with us about, and I think you're right, uh, not sort of travel, but just if people plan on gathering with folks outside of their home over Thanksgiving or Christmas really is the issue or winter holiday, I'm sorry. Um, and so I, you know, we can send that out. We hope that everyone participates. And we hope that everyone makes the decisions that are right for their family over these uh, holidays because social, emotional, and mental well, uh, well-being is really, really important too. Um, you know, we recognize that. We're all feeling it. So um, if there are any other thoughts or questions. Yeah, I just uh, want to say I'm literally in uh, full agreement with, I think, literally everything has been said in this meeting, and I appreciate um uh, the administration, uh, Dr. Leal, you and your team, especially for not taking the easy way out, uh, because through this whole process, you guys have made the hard decisions and done this the hard way on behalf of our family. So as a parent, I really appreciate that. Um, and to all the teachers, I mean, I've, I've seen just in my own children's classes, how hard teachers are working um, and it does not go unnoticed. And just thank you from the bottom of my heart. And I know my friends feel the same way. Many of my friends feel the same way. So thank you for not taking the easy way out and for supporting families. And I think um, uh, I'm looking forward to the rest of the year because, you know, it's been a tough semester, but I also think it's been a great, a great semester. So kudos to all of you for that. Thanks, Andy. And I was just thinking about this too, and I've said it to my students no matter how far away it is, we're one day closer to being back to us all being back together. And whatever struggles that we have to do now, it'll just be that much worth it. And there's a lot of good news coming out. I was listening to a John Hopkins doctors. I mean, we've all become experts apparently, right? So it just, it's one day closer and whatever we have to do, it'll make it that much more worth it if it can be even closer. That's all. Thanks for saying that, Paige, because I do think we all need some hope right now. And the vaccination news this week was very uh, hopeful and gives me a lot of optimism for especially next year, but even into the spring semester. The health department um, is already gearing up. They are co contacting schools to use their parking lots for drive through vaccinations. We're talking about a coordinated effort like we've never seen before. Um, and I would encourage folks to consider, highly consider that when the vaccine is proven safe, that we go out and go ahead and do that. Um, it, you know, the health department will be, you know, they're building the infrastructure right now for the two shot vaccine, which is difficult to administer and get people back 28 days apart. They're working on an app. It'll be, here's your appointment. Here's 28 days from now. Here's a reminder, come back and get in this line. Kids will be in this line because they take longer. Adults will be in this line. So people are coordinating to get this off the ground. And in the phases that I've seen proposed, K-12 staff and educators are in the second phase, which is really good news. Kids would be in the third phase and young adults and then anyone else besides healthcare and essential workers who are in the first phase would be in the fourth phase. So K-12 educators being early in that process is really uh, exciting and, and a good news for me because 
we will be able to open that much quicker once people feel confident that they are protected. And, um, you know, just so grateful. I feel like I need to put a shout out to one of our board members. His his son actually worked on the Pfizer vaccine and um, just so proud of that connection and, and Lake Bluff, so many great uh, things in this town, but just an amazing accomplishment. And um, I do have that sense of hope for that reason. I really, really do. And I, Paige, it's a great, I, it's a great thing to think about. We're just one day closer to when we can get back to a place where our kids are with us and uh, we all know that that's a better spot. Okay, folks, so I'm um, gonna wrap this up. So a uh, communication will be coming out uh, this afternoon, like I have been, uh, I'll make the call, you know, through Thanksgiving and then our next call, we'll, we'll take a look at things the Tuesday before Thanksgiving. Um, and I'll figure out when we need that survey data so that we can make the call that Tuesday for the next, and you know, to Jackie's point, as far out as we can so that people can plan. Um, unless there's any other thoughts. Nothing, Michelle? Uh, I was, well, I was just gonna bring, Aaron put in a good question about just the planning and preparation that's needed if we are gonna be um, having to be out longer, just, and you and I kind of have discussed possible um, planning time or planning remote planning days here and there. So that might be a possibility coming up as well. That's a great, us. Aaron. It, Michelle and I have and Paige have talked about the use of our three remaining remote learning planning days. Remember, ISB gave us five. Those count as student attendance days, but students don't learn that day. They're sort of like additional institute days. Um, so we have three left because we use two in the beginning of the year to have that long institute data or week to plan. So since we have three left, that is something that's on our radar um, for time for teachers to plan and prepare. Yeah, we definitely heard on the resource survey that parents like um, low tech and would like more um, off screen assignments and uh, work to do. Uh, but more check-in with teachers sometimes. So, you know, we're kind of sifting through that um, information that we got from parents. Um, but yeah, we definitely want to give teachers time to prep and prepare and send the right things home. That's great. I know that that's a big stressor for us, especially like in the lower elementary as we do try to send and give them as much like paper and hands on things like school. So thinking about going into like the unknown of after Thanksgiving and trying to like have our own mental breaks at home over Thanksgiving. I know that that um, has been stressful for my team of thinking of beyond if we don't know what's happening that week and just if we could have that time to know that we would have um, days to plan if we're going to be out longer than the 30th would be great. That's great. Thanks, Erin. If I can just piggyback off that, I know I've heard students say, you know, if we go remote, I'm going to, you know, stay at grandma and grandpa's house. So they might not even be doing their learning from Lake Bluff. So if we have materials to give out and we go week by week, they may not be able to get those materials. So that's just something else to think about as far as, um, you know, when you make the call of, you know, how much time we're planning for, um, just for family, you know, like for our students, if they're not in town, they can't really get the materials. <laughs> No, that's great, Anne. Thank you. I appreciate you saying that. Kelly, did you have something you wanted to share? Yeah, it was just, um, I, I, it's getting a little blurry how much we talked about this at the board meeting versus within the task force, but um, just acknowledging creating space to bring our most at-risk students into the building during this pause. And so um, we can elaborate upon that here if that feels helpful. I, the first thing that I wanted to do was just extend gratitude uh, to staff and families that are willing and open to participating in this. So at the elementary school, we are prioritizing sort of our most at risk 20 students, uh, creating space within the building for those students to have access to some specialists face to face, um, but to really have an environment here where they can connect remotely to their teachers and the learning um, and be, have a safe space within school to do that work, as well as our pre-K three and pre-K four learners. Um, so just appreciate the staff really putting the idea out there and helping us to run with it. And then for families being open to that idea. So I think minimizing uh, certainly less than 10 in a room feels good for us. And we know that 
um, it's going to be really helpful for students. I believe the middle school is also operating around that 20 students across sixth, seventh, and eighth grade. So thanks for mentioning that, Kelly. That is something I forgot. Yeah, we know remote learning is really hard uh, on some of our kids in particular. So we want to try to support that as long as we can. Anything else for the good of the group? You guys, I can't tell you enough how much I appreciate this group coming together just to be a sounding board. It's so many great ideas, so many thoughts. Um, it's great to share um, and have people be involved and see these conversations. So thank you so much for sticking with us. And if I don't, Kelly? Is the letter going out just a time frame for the folks in the Zoom room? Did, did, if we just wanted to put that out there, do we, do we know when we're committing? Yeah, it's coming out today. Yep, later on today, expected around four o'clock. Um, We'll have some timelines in there for the survey. I'm going to uh, take a lot of the feedback I got today into account. Uh, great suggestion for the union to kind of handle the teacher side of it. So um, Michelle and I will connect on that. Um, and I'll take care of the community side. And teachers, if you wouldn't mind helping me with that in terms of your communication, like just pointing people back to make sure they fill it out so we get a really accurate um, uh, picture of what's happening. Thanks everyone. If I don't see you, have a great holiday. It's one of my favorites.